Welcome to the New Thinking for a New World podcast, where we explore the most pressing issues that are challenging and changing our societies. We are looking for new thinking and new solutions wherever we can find them. Listen as host Alan Stoga, the Talberg Foundation's chairman, challenges his guests for analysis, ideas and actions. Together, we can help make our world at least a bit better. While much of the world's attention has been focused on the grinding Russian war in Ukraine, over the last months, there have been a series of extraordinary developments in the Middle East that could have almost as big an impact on the shape of the emerging global order. A partial list. China's engineering a rapprochement between supposedly implacable enemies, Iran and Saudi Arabia. The Arab League celebrating the return of Syria's President Assad. Saudi Arabia's application to join the Shanghai Cooperation Organization while also moving towards membership in the BRICS. A growing web of diplomatic, economic, and financial ties among China, Saudi Arabia, and other Arab countries, Iran, and even Russia that have intensified as the West tries to enforce draconian sanctions against several of those countries. My guest today can help us make sense of all this. Gilles Capel is one of France's leading experts on the Middle East. He writes a regular column for Al Monitor, which is a must read if you care about what's happening in the region. Welcome, Gilles. Many thanks. Henry Kissinger once described his most important diplomatic achievement in the Middle East as establishing that the road to peace ran through Washington, not Moscow. Fast forward to 2023. Does the new road to peace and prosperity, perhaps, now run through Beijing? Well, it does to an extent, because as you mentioned, uh, Beijing brokered the deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran uh, because uh, Beijing could deliver Tehran. Uh, Tehran needs Beijing uh, in order to survive economically. Uh, Tehran is part and parcel of the Road and Belt uh, Initiative. And uh, without, uh, you know, Chinese help, uh, Iranian economy uh, would be in shambles. And uh, hence, uh, if uh, China does not want uh, Iran to tell the Yemeni Houthis to send drones on Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran won't give the instruction to his uh, allies. Uh, this is something that clearly America couldn't do. And, uh, you know, the test was, uh, uh, in the, uh, just last year and the year before when there were attacks on Saudi territory, either, uh, from uh, Yemeni Houthis, you know, uh, uh, Iran's proxies or, uh, coming from southern Iraq, uh, where they were uh, sent by, uh, launched by, uh, another Iranian proxy, the so-called uh, Iraqi Hezbollah, and uh, America couldn't do anything. They couldn't deter it. Hence, for Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, making a deal with, uh, with Beijing is, is far better. All the more so as uh, Saudi Arabia and Beijing are in business. Uh, Saudi Arabia exports uh, a lot of oil to Beijing, which is its uh, first uh, clients. Hence, uh, the Chinese are not interested in having uh, their uh, the, the oil uh, Saudi oil tankers uh, traffic interrupted, and uh, therefore there there you know uh, a deal of the different components of which are perfectly functional, whereas America. Uh, cannot deliver. Uh, to start with, uh, America and Saudi Arabia are not really in business anymore over oil. Uh, uh, America has regained uh, oil independence that it had in the in the good old days, uh, thanks to shale oil, uh, uh, conditional to the fact that oil prices are sufficiently high, and to that extent. You know, uh, sanctions uh, against Russia are a good thing uh, because the prices are high. Uh, And um, also, uh, America does not import much Saudi oil at all. So, you know, the the, the, the sort of business relation between the the two countries on this issue is not uh, not important. 
Uh, add to that that Russia now is a member of OPEC Plus, uh, and uh, Saudi Arabia has shown more solidarity with his OPEC Plus partner than it has shown with America. You know, the the, the core issue, uh, even before Kissinger's day, was the the so called Quincy. Uh, St. Valentine or Valentine's Day agreement on the 14th of February 1945 between FDR and King Abdelaziz, my oil for your protection, my protection for your oil. This is now obsolete because uh, the Saudis can export their oil to whoever they want in Asia, and they don't need any, uh, any U.S. blessing for that. NB, uh, uh, Chinese uh, mediation proved more satisfactory from a protection point of view than America's protection. So far, as you've just described, China's role has been mostly about economics and now about diplomacy, but not yet really about security and defense, except in this indirect way with the Iranians. Do you think in the world as it's unfolding that the Chinese will play the kind of role that the Americans have played for the last decades in the security space? Well, you know, um, when I grew up uh, as a French kid uh, many years ago in the former cen- in the previous century, uh, we used to say that the most important uh, state in the Mediterranean was the American Sixth Fleet, which is not really the case anymore because the, Amer- so the Mediterranean is, uh, is no more uh, a central point of, uh, of U.S. security. And uh, what made the news in the China Seas uh, last week was that uh, a Chinese uh, aircraft ca- carrier had crossed the, the thin line between uh, Taiwan uh, waters and China's water in the Straits of Taiwan. So um, China is, is now clearly uh, maybe only gesturing, but is... Uh, is positioning itself in the realm of politics and, if necessary, of warfare. They've had a tremendous increase in their uh, uh, military spending in the Chinese budget. And this is uh, definitely uh, something that is changing uh, the the face of the the world uh, uh, defense. Let's talk a bit about the Saudi and Iranian rapprochement beyond the China aspect. For the last several decades, one of the governing ideas in the region had been the famous Shia crescent, the confrontation between Shia on the one hand, Sunni on the other hand, Iran and Saudi. Do you think that is over? Uh, I wouldn't say so, no. Uh, It's solely being put down for the time being because uh, the uh, Iranian interests uh, 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 and the uh, and the uh, Arab or the Arabian uh, Peninsula state GCC interests are definitely uh, not exactly the same. Uh, Iran has always uh, been willing to reach out to the Mediterranean Sea. I mean, something that traces back to to Cyrus the, the Great, and uh, which you know uh, led to the, the counteroffensive by uh, by Alexander the Great in the good old days. And um, what the Islamic Republic had managed to do was to reach out to Hezbollah in southern Lebanon uh, on the basis of a common Shia identity through uh, Syria, which is not Shia, um, a major, a Shia majority country, but an Alawi controlled country. The Alawis, uh, to which a sect to which uh, President Bashar al Assad. Uh, uh, belongs is not really Shia, but it's not Sunni. It's not part of the majority uh, Muslim um, sect. Iraq is majority uh, Shia, and thanks to American neocons, uh, has passed under uh, Iranian tutelage to a, to a large extent after the failure of the of the uh, U.S. Uh, invasion and occupation, and. Uh, Iran has managed, you know, to build this, it's been called Shiite Crescent by uh, King Abdullah of Jordan, but has managed to, to create an access to the Mediterranean, which is extremely important for its security because out of su- southern Lebanon, and even more so with drones and everything that we see now, Shia has the capacity 
to strike Israel very easily. So in case there is any kind of attack on Iran, uh, it is immediately uh, answered by an attack by Hezbollah and Hamas to uh, some extent, but mostly Hezbollah on, on the Jewish state. And this is the Iranian form of deterrence, if you wish. Uh, uh, now, Iran has also used that against Saudi Arabia. Uh, it has used its proxies uh, in, uh, in Yemen against Saudi Arabia, just it, as it used its proxies in Lebanon against Israel. And uh, this is unbearable for uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, so I believe that uh, since Mohammed bin Salman uh, took power, uh, he was uh, keen sort of to put down the uh, Iranian issue in order to uh, build his own uh, uh, expansion into the Arab world. Uh, and uh, the Jeddah summit in, uh, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, a few days ago uh, demonstrated that uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman has a completely new agenda. That is to say, he has uh, done with the uh, uh, you know, extreme Wahhabi puritanical uh, Islam. You can now wear shorts in Saudi Arabia. You have, uh, you go to a restaurant where a female Saudi chef without a veil uh, treats you with, uh, you know, uh, cuisine and what have you. And uh, and we, Saudi women go to the beach and and so on and so forth. So it's it's a sea change uh, within the the, the the Saudi fabric. Is not interested interested in playing the uh, the radical uh, or the extremely conservative Islamic um, uh, fiddle, if I may say so, anymore. And uh, he's refocusing on uh, influence over the whole Arab world. And uh, in doing so, uh, he doesn't want uh, to uh, underline the antagonism with uh, with Iran. Uh, it's more a sort of uh, armed peace uh, or armed truce, if I, if I may say so, than, uh, than real peace. Because uh, as long as, uh, as Iran needs this hostility to survive, uh, they will do it. But uh, if the Iranians believe that uh, Chinese um, tutelage or are coerced to believe that Chinese tutelage is good for them, then the antagonism between the two countries decreases. And this is what the, the Saudis are thinking about. The logical next question you've already hinted at, which is Israel and Israel combined with Iranian nuclear file. What could clearly upset that very tenuous balance you just described uh, is further development of uh, Iranian breakout capability and or Israeli effort to stop it? Well, one thing might be that, you know, uh, China is not interested in having Iran attacking Israel. And uh, if we follow the same line of reasoning as we started before. And uh, also, uh, I guess that, you know, um, the, the Saudis watch very closely the capacity of, uh, of Israel to strike at, uh, at Iran. I mean, and the, uh, the Israelis have managed to kill a number of uh, uh, Iranian uh, nuclear scientists of, uh, uh, you know, uh, sending a virus into uh, Iranian nuclear uh, uh, computers, uh, checking their system and so on and so forth. But this was rebuilt, and uh, you know it. It was to no avail, uh, really. So um, the um, the Saudis, therefore, are uh, dubious again about the West's capacity in general, America, but also Israel as part of the West, to uh, to check the Iranian threats, and they they turn to uh, to China, because they think that on the short term, at least. It is, um, it is performing better. Uh, as of Israel also, there's another issue here, that is uh, the, the Abraham Accords or Agreements, you know, that were signed by uh, uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Bahrain, but Bahrain is, uh, 
is to to a large extent uh, a, a vassal state of uh, Saudi Arabia. So uh, it is not of the same importance as Saudi Arabia or the Emirates. It is not oil rich anymore. And the fact that they signed me- meant that Saudi Arabia did not object to the agreements, but was not part of it. Then you have the Sudan, which is now out because of its uh, civil war, and the Kingdom of Morocco, which uh, signed the the agreements because they had on their own agenda the fact that America would recognize uh, Moroccan sovereignty against on Western Sahara, something on which the European Union has been much more cautious, and which allowed uh, Morocco now to try to strong arm. European states so that they align on the American position. But this, you know, looked like it was better than the neocon uh, pipe dream, if I may say so, uh, of, you know, uh, having uh, Iraq uh, become an American style democracy with Democrats and Republicans. And then they they thought that Warsaw and uh, Baghdad were more or less the same. Uh, because uh, what worked or seemed to work uh, in the Abraham Agreements was the sort of J, uh, JV thing. You know, uh, uh, Israeli uh, startup nation tech and uh, uh, with uh, Emirati uh, petrol dollar cash and, and the like. But uh, this meant that, you know, the, the the hatchet was buried with the Palestinians. No one cared. The Palestinians were so divided between Hamas, uh, P, uh, the PA, uh, Islamic Jihad, and the fact and the like that the Arabs, you know, were sick and tired of that. Now, uh, many things change, particularly with uh, Bibi Netanyahu's new government. Bibi being hostage to uh, its uh, settlers and uh, to Itamar Ben Gvir and, uh, and and the like has raised uh, to a uh, uh, level of outrage, if I may say so, uh, Arab uh, antagonism against Israel. And it is extremely difficult now for uh, Arab states in order to, if they want to to have a sort of, of wide, uh, wide array Arab backing uh, to, uh, to deal uh, with uh, with the uh, Abraham Agreements. If you look at the Jeddah summit, uh, the Moroccans made the declaration insisting on the fact that the King of Morocco was the chairman of the El Quds Committee that helped the Palestinians. You know, it totally toned down the reality of uh, um, uh, Israeli-Moroccan cooperation, which is extremely important on military affairs in particular, uh, and that raises fears in Algeria. Uh, and uh, likewise, uh, the, um, the the UAE were the first to give uh, red carpet treatment to Bashar al-Assad. Assad was received, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, with a state visit by um, Mohammed bin Zayed in Abu Zabi, in order for the Arabs to to focus on uh, Abu Zabi as you know, championing the former champion of Arabism that was Syria and not focus too much on uh, the UAE relation with Israel. I'm glad you mentioned Bashir al-Assad. Last I checked, the West pretty much agrees that he's a war criminal. Yet at the same time, he's welcomed back into, as you just said, Abu Dhabi on two state visits um, and more recently embraced by the Arab League. Again, it seems an indicator of the dramatic transformation that's going on in the region as they take back their own destiny. The question is this, we've lived through a period where long ago it was the Brits, then the Americans from 1945 on, uh, the Russians for a while, the Americans again from the 70s on, drove geopolitics in the region. Arguably, what's happened is that it is now the Arabs and perhaps the Iranians themselves driving the shape of their region. Do you think that's sustainable? To an extent, definitely. This is the this is the will of uh, of Mohammed bin Salman. He doesn't consider that uh, 
you know, here's the gas station to the West, as uh, was the case in the, in the past. Yeah, like uh, the Saudi kingdom uh, used, uh, you know, it's, it's a puranetical way of Islam, uh, dealt with, uh, with his population the way it wished. Uh, but what was at the end of the day, what is important was whether it was good for, uh, for American uh, um, oil, oil men to, to a large extent and the Republican Party. Uh, this is not the case anymore. I mean, uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman snubbed uh, Biden when he asked him to uh, uh, increase the oil production in order to inflict uh, punishment on Russia and so that the, the price of oil would go down. Uh, and um, he also was extremely resentful against uh, the Biden administration uh, because uh, President Biden had called him a pariah, said he would not shake his hand because of uh, Jamal Khashoggi's uh, murder. Uh, and uh, then, you know, to some extent, Biden had to go to Kanasa, uh, went to Saudi Arabia last year, uh, asked for the, uh, the oil uh, production increase and uh, was turned down. And this was clearly a slap. And uh, then if you look at the Jeddah uh, summit, everybody thought that Bashar al-Assad would be the, you know, the star. But uh, the limelight was stolen by someone else, Zelensky. Why would uh, um, uh, Mohammed bin Salman invite Zelensky, who came on a, on a French presidential plane, courtesy of Emmanuel Macron, so that the Russians would not uh, destroy it? or who in a, anyone else, uh, because he wanted to show also to Vladimir Putin that he, Hamid bin Salman, Saudi Arabia, were, was calling the shots, not Russia. Russia is, uh, uh, is now in, in a difficult position in the Ukraine war. It is not at all sure that Russia will win. Uh, it is facing enormous pressure. The country is uh, increasingly impoverished. Much of its elites are running away, uh, and therefore uh, Saudi Arabia uh, is not dependent on uh, on Russia. I know it can use Russia to balance uh, the U.S. or Europe, but uh, he is the one who's gonna uh, uh, who's gonna have a say, not Vladimir Putin. And this was uh, this was something that uh, was a means to assert uh, Saudi. Uh, uh, sort of uh, position and uh, also uh, a way to some to some extent to reassure the west uh, that even though he had received a super bad guy uh, war criminal Bashar al-Assad nevertheless he he listened to to Zelensky who himself is the victim of war crimes by Vladimir Putin so this is a sort of uh, super transactional uh, a relationship with a new emerging power, and there are others in the region, uh, which uh, do not abide by the old uh, post-WW2 world order, and uh, even more so, do not abide by uh, what was called uh, American hyperpower uh, after the demise of the, of the Soviet Union. We are now into a much more multipolar system with the rise of China, the rise of the BRICS or whatever you, you call them, and uh, or the Shanghai uh, organization that you mentioned earlier, uh, the attempt of the European Union to, to stick together uh, uh, militarily, uh, which is not easy. And uh, so this is a totally new uh, world system that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the era of Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger is alive and kicking. He's uh, he's celebrating his his uh, hundredth uh, anniversary, and uh, he's uh, definitely been one of the critical thinkers of the of the of the twentieth and the early twenty first century. But we, I think, we are now getting, if I may say so, into a post Kissingerian uh, era. If you feel that the world lacks global leaders. Please help support the Talberg Foundation programs. Individual donations are being accepted at talbergfoundation.org slash donate. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G 
foundation.org slash donate. We're making a souffle here, and I want to add yet one more ingredient, which is President Erdogan and Turkey. Recently re-elected uh, his AKP party with a absolute majority in the, in the parliament. Does he look east or does he look west? Is he a player in this new Middle East that you've been describing to me? Well, you know, uh, there is this famous uh, saying that we have in French, I know where you have it in English, about the bat. The bat says, I'm uh, a bird, see my wings, but I'm, uh, I'm an animal, see my flesh. And uh, to some extent, uh, President Erdogan, just like the other uh, leaders I mentioned, is playing both ways. He is a NATO men- member, but uh, he buys S-400s from uh, Russia. Uh, he uh, looks uh, east. He, uh, you know, uh, one of his ministers said, if the opposition wins uh, at the last uh, polls, uh, they will drink champagne. If we win, uh, people will uh, pray uh, uh, towards Mecca in, uh, you know, thanking Allah for our victory. Uh, he won. Uh, he won uh, irrespective of what many pundits and polls predicted because they thought that the economy of Turkey is in a catastrophic state. The Turkish lira had plummeted. The earthquakes in February uh, caused more than 50,000 dead uh, to a large extent because um, uh, local authorities were bribed by developers in order to build uh, uh below the threshold of uh, anti-seismic uh, um, laws. and uh, But uh, nevertheless, uh, the core of the Anatolian Sunni Turkish population voted in Erdogan because they would not trust an opposition headed by uh, someone who made no secret that he was an Alevi, i.e. it's part of a... Of a nuance among the different Shias, someone also with partly Kurdish origins. This uh, is it's something that shows that Turkey is heavily divided because he did not win by a landslide. He won by a little more than uh, 50%, 52 against 48. So that shows you that you have uh, two Turkeys in a way. And if you look at the map, Istanbul, Ankara, uh, the uh, western Aegean, Aegean coast, and the southern uh, uh, Mediterranean coast down to Hatay or Antakya, uh, with the border with, uh, with Syria, voted in majority for the opposition, whereas the core Anatolian heartland voted for this sort of synthesis between nationalism, hyper-Turkish nationalism, anti-Kurdish, and uh, very strongly uh, Muslim identity-based nationalism. So Erdogan has played both, uh, uh, and uh, he will, uh, I believe, use this in order to maximize his power. For instance, as a NATO member, he reiterated that he was uh, uh, using his veto rights not to have um, Sweden into Turkey because there are Kurds in Sweden and that he wants extradited to to Turkey, accuses of being war criminals uh, or whatever. And this is a strange thing. A NATO member that buys S-400s from Russia on the one hand and vetoes uh, Sweden's entry into NATO on, on the other hand. So this, is, this epitomizes, if you wish, the, the kind of, of game that Erdogan is playing, I think it is deeply rooted in a, in a vision or a reading of Ottoman history uh, that, uh, you know, it's not so much that it would be a bridge between East and West, but it would maximize its position of being in between. But it also shows the weakness of Washington and perhaps Paris and Berlin as well, that the dynamism in this story is all outside that core members who, who used to define Western security. 
uh, we are takers, not not givers of, of, of that driving power. How does this play out in the next period, do you think? Well, it's a little different for Europe and America because uh, Europe now is um, under uh, the threats, whether it is real or it is politically believed, which is part of a parcel of reality of uh, illegal immigration from across the Mediterranean, south, southern and eastern. And uh, Erdogan is a master play, player in that. He got a lot of money from the European Union, uh, several billions of euros, in order to keep immigrants into Turkey, which became a problem for him because the opposition uh, just said, you know, we want all those Syrians and Afghans out. But this did not resound that much uh, because, uh, you know, uh, Syrians and, uh, and Afghans do jobs that now Turks, who have to some extent become affluent, don't want to you. Who takes the trash in Istanbul? Afghan refugees. Who drives the trucks? Syrians. And so on and so forth. So, the, um, and, and by the same token, you know, they are ready to open the borders whenever there is an issue of tension with Bulgaria, uh, Greece, on Thracia, and on the, the uh, agency, with also this problem in Europe that Germany, the, the German models, needs workforce. There are the Germany and Italy, for instance, uh, uh, have a very big demographic problem. They don't have kids. They'd rather enjoy the good life. So uh, there are there are no more uh, no more workers. And you the problem with Europe is that you have to let immigrants in. And uh, the same is true, and is even worse uh, with uh, southern uh, immigration, because at least with eastern immigration, you have a spoiler. I mean, Erdogan is is is, is an interlocutor. I mean, he's strong arming the EU. Uh, but he is an interlocutor. On the southern side, you have no interlocutor. You have migrants going through Morocco or Algeria to Spain, through Tunisia or Libya to uh, Italy, and then from Italy into France, uh, into trying to reach out to, to Britain and the like. And this, in turn, has led to the rise of uh, right-wing and extreme right parties all over Europe. So. This is changing the whole face of the, of the Mediterranean. And, you know, for the difference is that in, in Europe, uh, immigration is predominantly Muslim, coming from Africa, North Africa, or Asia. Uh, and jihadism is also something that had to do with not all Muslims, of course, but a number of militants. So within the mindset of the German population, this is confused. Whereas in America, it's the things are, are separated. The mass of illegal immigration comes from Latin America, it's not Muslim. The mass of uh, the population which is uh, jailed is, uh, uh, is black American. It's not, you know, and Muslims are immigrants, uh, uh, mostly in... Um, sort of middle-class jobs. Uh, people from the Middle East are uh, more middle-class than uh, working-class in the States. And uh, terrorists, if you wish, uh, have no link with the Muslim population of America, neither with nor with the uh, uh, immigrant population at large. In, in Europe, it is being uh, perceived confusedly by, by the electorate, hence the, the strong tensions that we perceive. So last question, which is almost impossible to answer. What you've described is a region where the Americans are both leaving and being pushed out. You've described a region that becomes, for all the migra migration story purposes, ever more important to Europe, but Europe lacks much agency to shape it. Uh, if we fast forward a few years, uh, what what is the consequence for the Middle East and for Europe? Well, um, as far as uh, America and to a lesser extent Europe is concerned, uh, China has become the big issue. Like, for instance, you know, 
when uh, after Columbus discovered America, Venice was ruined because Venice was the center of trade between uh, medieval Latin Europe or uh, early Renaissance uh, Latin Europe and and the East and the Levant and silks and whatever that came from uh, spices uh, that came from uh, Egypt, from, that came from uh, Syria uh, and the like. And nowadays, uh, as Hegel would have uh, mentioned uh, earlier on, the, the you know the, the spirit of the world is is moving uh, to the west. But this west is the western side of America, which would was our east, i.e., China, and uh, you know the uh, and then um, uh, China and, and sorry, uh, America has, if I may say so, a looking west policy, i.e. Not the west of Europe, which is America, but the west of America, which is China, which is the Pacific. Hence, the the sort of look east policy of America, i.e., dealing with the Atlantic, dealing with NATO, and uh, with uh, with peace and security in the Eurasian uh, uh, continent, if I may say so, is not uh, the priority for the United States uh, nowadays. I mean. Uh, the center of the United States is moving from, uh, politically, I mean, from uh, from New York to, to California or from D.C. to California, just like in uh, Saudi Arabia, the center of power is moving from Riyadh, which was based on, on the, the oil issues in the Arabian or Persian Gulf, to Jeddah and the West Coast, which West and the Red Sea, sorry, and the West Coast of Saudi Arabia, which is... Um, Looking at the uh, the Chinese uh, containers that uh, you know, as a matter of one every five minutes, goes uh, into the Suez Canal to uh, the Mediterranean and Europe, and uh, so this is, I believe, one of the big economic shifts uh, uh, that we witness now, which uh, did not, uh, which was in the making in the in the Kissinger uh, era, but then. This translates into different types of challenges, and for for the EU, the main issue is, uh, you know, EU is an economic giant, but it's uh, military and uh, security dwarf, uh, due uh, among other things to different visions of Europe among uh, its leaders. So, you know, there are only two countries with a relatively uh, fair. Uh, military capacity in Europe, which are Britain, which is not part of the EU anymore, and France. Uh, then the, the others, uh, you know, Germany has had no military budget at all. Uh, Mrs. Merkel and Mr. Scholz finally decided that they would they would um, revamp the Bundeswehr, but uh, because uh, they thought that uh, Russia was not, more, no, not a threat anymore, they just dismantled it. And uh, the once mighty Bundeswehr of uh, of uh, you know uh, Germany of the last century until the Third Reich uh, was just uh, the, a shadow of himself, of itself. So uh, this is what is at stake now in Europe. And uh, as you as you mentioned, uh, I think uh, very shrewdly, this is we are takers more than uh, than givers, and uh, this needs an important revolution because. Uh, that allowed for Europe to to live r- relatively well, to have a social uh, model that is uh, providing a number of, uh, of hours of uh, days of, of, of holidays and uh, with uh, you know uh, very significant uh, social expenses, much more than in America. And uh, to what extent can we can we go on? Uh, with that, with war at our borders on the one hand, and uh, uh, illegal migra- migration on, on the other borders on the other hand, so this is the the big uh, uh, the big question uh, that is ahead of us for uh, for the years and decades to come. Uh, I'm not sure that either of us will will be alive when it's solved, but this is another prediction which I dare not confirm. I don't know if I would characterize all that as an unstable disequilibrium or maybe an enormous storm about to hit us. In any event, I'd like to thank you, Gilles Capel, for this conversation. 
for spending time with us today and for your thinking about the new world that is emerging in the Middle East. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Please rate our show on Apple Podcasts and subscribe. Meanwhile, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergfoundation.org to learn more about our work. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org. Thank you and we'll be back again next week for another episode of Talberg's New Thinking for a New World. This podcast was brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation.